This is KGW News at 11. Hello and welcome to KGW News at 11 on this Friday night. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. We begin with a violent first few months of the year in Portland that has community leaders looking for answers. Solutions could range from transforming the city and its approach to shootings to also bringing in some outside help. KGW's Mike Benner explains. Just weeks after the formation of the Enhanced Community Safety Team, or ECST for short, there are rumblings of even more resources heading to the streets to fight gun violence in the Rose City. KGW has learned that a plan for the FBI and ATF to work with the ECST is now under review by city leaders. They come in and they do the enforcement part. They, they're the accountability part. During a virtual panel discussion on gun violence Friday afternoon, Roy Moore explained that so much more goes into stopping the gunfire. The former gang member is part of a hospital-linked violence and prevention program where he goes to the hospital and sits bedside with gunshot victims. It's a scary moment. So that's when I try to come in and I try to provide support. I advocate for you, but most of all, I try to get you to make some different decisions. Another way to prevent violence is through environmental design. Turn a dilapidated area into a park in an effort to reduce crime and increase community engagement and the perception of safety. We've tended to think about violence as an individual issue that's addressed through the criminal legal system, but there's a growing understanding that it's actually a community and public health issue, and it needs to be treated as such. And sooner rather than later, in the first two and a half months of 2021, there have been more than 225 shootings in Portland. That compares to 111 in the first three months of last year. If we're going to treat gun violence as the public health issue that I believe it is, We've also got to talk about and invest in community-based strategies for preventing and responding to violence. Couple that with the enhanced community safety team that may soon be working with the FBI and ATF. And just maybe we'll see a drop in the number of shootings. You know, it's scary. As long as bullets are flying, none of us are safe. A spokesperson for the mayor's office tells me if the ATF and FBI were to join the ECST, Federal money and expertise could be used to disrupt the cycle of gun violence. But before any deal is signed, the mayor wants to make sure that city commissioners and other colleagues have time to ask questions and understand how this will work. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Portland is asking agencies to scale back this year because of the pandemic's impact on the budget. And there are concerns within Portland Fire and Rescue that those cuts could have serious consequences. They're considering cuts like saving $760,000 by eliminating about six administrative positions. Most are vacant right now. Another $120,000 cut would decommission an old fire boat. But the biggest reduction of nearly $5.2 million would cut more than 40 positions and close one and a half stations. I've never seen a time in my 20 years where we have shown how important the frontline services are for the city of Portland. And I just think that this is not the time to cut. Fire Chief Sarah Boone argues these cuts will disproportionately impact fire and medical services for BIPOC Portlanders. The union says the fire department shouldn't have to make that choice. Firefighters hope the city uses federal aid to keep that from happening. In the pandemic, Oregon Governor Kate Brown says the state is moving up its COVID vaccine timelines and expanding eligibility. Now this coming Monday, counties that have vaccinated most of their seniors, 65 and older can move to the next group, which is 45 and older with underlying conditions, along with frontline workers. Also on the 22nd, seasonal and migrant workers who are already working are eligible for the vaccine. Then, on March 29th, all adults in Oregon, 45 to 64, who have underlying conditions, are eligible for shots, along with other agricultural workers not covered by that earlier date, and those who are homeless and people in congregate living conditions. The other change comes on April 19th, when frontline workers, as defined by the CDC, become eligible, along with people living in multi-generational households and people 16 to 44 with underlying conditions. Then, the big date, May 1st, anyone in Oregon 16 and older is eligible for the COVID vaccine. OHA Director Patrick Allen said in the next two months, all those groups represent two million people. He says there will probably be enough vaccine. 
As we've seen before, we know there will be temporary traffic jams as demand exceeds supply. We know it'll take a couple of weeks to get through the surge, but we can keep pace. If we receive approximately 250,000 or more first doses per week from the federal government starting in early April and continuing at that rate through the spring. Next week, Oregon will get roughly 192,000 doses. And Allen said he does not see a significant increase in the next three weeks in those doses, but he's hopeful that will change. Today, the governor also spoke about new guidance from the CDC, which is now recommending three feet of spacing between desks and schools instead of six. This is welcome news for many school districts. After ODE and OHA update their guidance, school districts will still need to have conversations at the local level to update their plans for a return to in-person instruction. Six feet is still recommended between adults and students and during activities that increase transmission risk, like eating, singing, and sports. The agency says it only applies if everyone's wearing masks and other safety protocols are in place. The guidelines also vary depending on the rate of COVID infections in the community. Here's how vaccines look in Washington. So far, 21% of people have received one dose. They also just expanded eligibility. Vaccine appointments open March 31st for anyone 60 and older, people living or working in a group setting, restaurant workers, also people who have two or more medical conditions. Also in Washington, the state is now allowing indoor visits at long-term care facilities, as long as visitors or residents are fully vaccinated. And that is welcome news for people who've not seen family members or friends for months or even a year. It's especially good news for 106-year-old Margie Conover. She has survived her second pandemic, if you can believe that. She and her son Sherman are now fully vaccinated, and last week they were able to finally safely embrace. It's hard to explain it in words how great it's going to be for you to kiss your, your mom and your grandparents and everything else. It's going to be fabulous. Sherman says he plans to visit his mom again and bring her favorite treats, hot bacon and fresh strawberries. Can't beat that. Oregon also has limited visitors to nursing homes and allows limited visits, except for in counties considered extreme risk. We now have body cam video that shows what it took to save a woman from a house fire in the Fairview area. Officer Tim Taaka was on patrol early Thursday morning when he heard about the fire over his radio. Ma'am, are you out? Where's he at? Where are you at? I don't know. I don't know. What takes you? What? Mom with a female victim. Uh, she's on the porch. She needs rescue. The woman's husband was trapped inside. Officer Taaka searched around the house to find him, but the smoke and the flames were too intense to go inside. That's when an off-duty Portland firefighter showed up. They found a ladder and they were able to rescue the woman from the balcony. The firefighter went inside the house without any gear in an attempt to find the missing man. Unfortunately, he did not survive. We don't know how the fire started. It took about 40 minutes to get it under control.